What is your name? John Clark. And where and when were you born? I was born in Manchester, 19th of the 4th, 1924. And what did your parents do for a living? My, my father had a wine and spirits business and my mother was a private secretary at Tootle Broad Ursley. And where did you go to school? Uh, Moss Side, Manchester. What age did you leave school? Fifteen. Can you describe a childhood memory that sticks in your mind? Yes. Playing for Manchester boys at football in the final of the English Shield at Main Road with 30,000 crowd. How old were you then? Uh, Fifteen. Uh, 14, sorry, 40. And what year was that? 1937-38. Uh, and what did you do for work before you joined the army? Uh, I was an apprentice instrument maker. So now we've got the basic information out of the way. Well, you haven't really, because I was, I was fostered then? out. Okay. Uh, when when uh, I was three years of age, uh, my mother and father split up. Uh, they eventually got divorced. Neither wanted me, and I got fostered out. And uh, I was fostered out till I was sixteen. But in those days, fostering was done in the courts. There were no such thing as social services. And um, when I was sixteen, I was on my own. When did you first go into fostering? Was it at sixteen? Uh, when I was three, nineteen twenty-seven. Hmm. So, what were your foster family like? Uh, two uh, elderly spinsters. They had a, a, a news agent tobacconist in Moss Side. And in those days, life was different. They, it was a community life, and they were more or less the organisers of the community in Moss Side. Um, they're very strict, but they're, uh, they're very good to me in many ways. And how long did you stay with them for? Till, till one died and one retired. And when she retired, I was just 16 and legally I was on my own then. So what did you do after that then? Well, I went into digs. Um, my wages were just about 30 shillings a week, out of which came a pound for me bed and breakfast. Uh, and many a time I used to have to walk, but I wasn't forced to work. You know, it's a money question. Of course, it's the war time. You appreciate that. And how long? How long were you doing that for? Well, until I enlisted when I was seventeen and a half, uh, nineteen forty-one, and uh, I, I enlisted uh, into uh, boys' uh, uh, battalion. Uh, it's quite a story. This went to Dover Street near the. Uh, university and uh, I wanted to join the, the Navy and when I got there the chap said how old I and I told him he said come back when you're 19 so then I didn't fancy going in the Air Force so uh, I was just going away and I happened to look down the corridor and there was this magnificent Scotsman in a kilt so I thought I'll have a go there so uh, I went and uh, my grandfather was a Scotsman, and uh, it was a black watch. And uh, he, he talked to me in a kind way and said, uh, well, here's his form, you filled it in, get your parents to sign it. And I said, well, I've got no parents. What were the names, he said. I told him, so he wrote them down. He said, you're in the army now, and gave me a shilling. So what was your motivation for enlisting? Why did you want to enlist? Uh, financial necessity in many ways, but uh, I'd been in the Home Guard before, you know, before I joined the Army. And uh, it, it was suddenly realised that this was something very important and uh, the main thing was to defend your country and the way of life. Yeah. So what was the name of your regiment? Black Watch. And did you have a choice of which unit you went into? Yes, because when you enlist, you you, uh, you have a choice of what regiment. 
But, um, well, like what she's written, fine, it's both in decorations for battles and for bravery awards. I was very fortunate. And how long have you, did you serve in the armed forces? From um, 43, August 43 to, I should have been demobbed in November 46, but uh, I was blown up in Jerusalem by a Jewish terrorist three weeks before the mob, and then I had to come home on a hospital ship. I was six months, uh, re you know, recuperating in Irvine in Scotland. So what happened after you'd enlisted? Well, I went in the boys' service, uh, and then uh, when I was 18, I transferred to the uh, 6th Battalion Black Watch, which was a territorial battalion. And then in 1943, we went out to uh, North Africa. And so that's where you did your training? Oh, no. Did the training in Britain, went out to North Africa to fight. Where did you do your training? Oh, did the training uh, in Perth. That was the headquarters, it was Queen's Barracks. And then Kim Ford, which is just down the road. Uh, and then uh, we went to a party in Scotland. Uh, and that was it, then off we went uh, to North Africa. How long was she training? Well, from uh, just over 12 months. And what, what did you, what did that encompass? What did you do? Well, you... the usual thing, get, getting everybody fit, learning how to fire a rifle, uh, combat, self-combat, uh, hundreds and hundreds of route marches, uh, living out rough, uh, assault courses, how to prime weapons and grenades. And did you ever have any problems during your training? Or did you enjoy it? Oh, I enjoyed it. It was something new. The, my main problem was that uh, I was one of the few Englishmen in, in a, a Scottish battalion. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, they, they used to be take the mickey out of the, 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 the English people, the, the jocks, but uh, eventually they became good friends. One or two punch-ups, you know. Over what? Oh, I, I, I can't remember that. That was something or other. I remember the first first breakfast I had in, in the barracks. They brought the breakfast in on trolleys. They brought it on defaulters. And at the tables, there was ten people on the table. And it was porridge. And uh, they passed the bowl of porridge to me, and I happened to say, where's the sugar? And they all did a big laugh, and they said, another satanac, which is a vulgar Scots word for an Englishman, you see. Because they put salt on, for I don't know why, but they do, on the porridge. But, uh, yeah, uh, they were good times. So you were 18 when you first went to South Africa? No, I didn't go to South Africa, I went to North, North Africa. North Africa, sorry. Yeah, I was nearly 19, yeah. Okay. And what was your first, your first experience over there? What can you remember? What, you mean the first battle? No, when you first went out there, what was Oh, that? well, seeing Arabs, I'd never seen any Arabs before. Uh, and, of course, the boat trip, uh, we were attacked on the way there in the Bay of Biscay by German, the convoy, uh, and there was U-boats around. But uh, and seeing Gibraltar, uh, we went through the into the Med from the Atlantic, landed at a place called Bougie, and then to Algiers. Uh, we landed in Algiers, and I always remember the Arab boys and the the, the way they were dressed, and the, that was a something surprising. How did you feel when you say you were uh, attacked the ship on your way over there? Frightened, obviously, the place, but there's nothing you could do about it. I mean, it's worse than being on land, being on sea, because you don't know where to go, have you, on the sea? Um, we weren't 
Well, with the convoy I was, we was uh, part of the convoy I was in, got away with it largely, but there were some ships got sunk. You know, there was a old tankers, and there was one uh, uh, um, supply ship got sunk there. Yeah. So, what did you think of Africa when you first landed? Well, it was something new. We didn't really think very much about it. The smell was the, the peculiar thing. It, it smells like a fatty, a fatty smell, you know, like a, in a chip shop where they've not cleaned out the pans. It was a, it was a kind of a, a cooking, for a, a better description. And of course, there's lots of other stinky smells as well that uh, everybody seemed as though they wanted to wash. But uh, that was it. So when you landed in Africa, were you were you joining local forces there, or was it all British? Oh no, we we went to a transit camp and immediately were set off for Tunisia. This is in uh, March '43. Uh, the campaign was over in the May. We we went into action and continuing action uh, until the, the first week in May. Um, but uh, there was one experience there where, where we uh, we actually rescued um, 200 uh, badly uh, injured uh, British and, and a few American prisoners of war from a Italian uh, hospital ship at a place called Corba on the Tunisian coast. That was exciting. So what happened there? Can you explain? Well, what happened there? We came out with we, we, the first big battle. I, I missed the first two. There was um, Banana Ridge and Peach Corn. I, I wasn't involved in that. But then we, we went to a place called Sidi Midian, which is a key point, And uh, we took it eventually. We had a bad experience there, though. That it was... Um, the first time we attacked, we were rationed with uh, ammunition and it, we thought that uh, the ammunition had been sunk by the U-boats coming through, you know, there was a shortage. We only got uh, five clips of uh, rifle bullets, the artillery were rationed and the anti-tank guns were rationed and of course we got to the... Uh, the big wells at Sydney Midian and held them and then now time we initially them we had to uh, retreat and we thought that the uh, it was due to the charge ammunition was due to the fact that the, the ammunition ships weren't getting through but that wasn't true the real story was it was uh, and this is a terrible thing to say there was a strike on in Britain the dockers in Glasgow Liverpool and Bristol went on strike for more money, for loading the ammunition ships, and they were, they were, the man who organised it was a man uh, who became quite famous as a trade union leader, Jack Jones. I could never forgive him that because he cost a lot of British troops their lives. Uh, he organised the Dockers Strike, Transport and General Workers Union, and uh, say we lost uh, quite a few lads through that. If we'd have had the ammunition, we could have held the place, but we didn't. Anyway, when that was over, we were, we always remember we were in, we were in a, a graveyard just outside some, I think it was kind of schools of some kind, and the commanding officer, uh, uh, Colonel Madden, he said, I, I've just uh, volunteered on behalf of everybody, and we all groaned, you know. He said, there's some of our lads on a hospital ship, uh, they'll, they'll be off to Italy shortly. They're very badly wounded, and it's going to be tricky. But we've got to break through the German lines. Uh, are you with me? So we all said yes, of course. So we set off with three tanks, A, B, C, and D Company. So when we got attacked on the way through, one company would drop out, and the others carry on, and the others follow through afterwards. And it worked very well. And when we got to uh, to Corba, it's a small fishing uh, port on the Tunisian coast, 
on the east coast of Tunisia. Uh, there was a ship in, in the dock, all lit up, white, with the Italian uh, colours, green, white and, and uh, red on. And it was uh, early, well, after midnight anyway. But it was lit up, the ship, because it was an hospital ship. There's an argument whether they should go on with our weapon, because being a, a hospital ship, it, it had international protection against firearms, you see. Anyway, the officer carried a revolver head, and we, we left our rifles behind, and we charged on the ship. And I'll never forget what happened then. <laughs> we got up the gangway, and right in front of us was the... And this is in the early hours of the morning. There were um, five Italians. Two were sat on the rails facing us as we came on the ship, and the other three with the bats to us, like looking over over the side. And when this one of these chaps saw us coming in, he fell off fell off the ship into the harbour. And never knew what happened to him. But then, <laughs> what happened then? The, we, we were told to go to certain uh, stairways and wait for a signal to go down into the ship. And uh, I'm just going, just took a couple of steps down and our pipe major started to play, you know, da 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 and uh, Alan Laddie it was. And I'm halfway down, I heard a voice shout, listen, listen, it was an English voice. The jocks are here, I could have wept. And it was wonderful. We got down there and it was darkish. The lights went on. There's a load of very terrified Italian nurses, <laughs> and the lads that were just waking up. Some had no arms, some were blind, some had no legs. Oh, it was off in the hammocks. Well, there weren't hammocks, there were beds really. And uh, one of them put his, his hand out to grab me and shake my hand. You see, and this nurse came and knocked it. And she was right, of course, because I was filthy. And this bloke was, was uh, in a bad way. Anyway, we, we, we stayed with them, the lads, and the uh, next day the Royal Navy came and took over the ship. Never knew what happened to it. And that was the... Uh, it'd be about the 8th or 9th of May, 1943. That was the end of our... Well, there's other stories, of course, afterwards, but... That, uh, that was the end of the campaign in North Africa. So did you get a lot of time off while you were fighting over there, or was it a constant...? You're joking. You're joking! <laughs> time off? Where could you go? <laughs> you could only swim, and if you went swimming in, in the med day and you got bitten by a starfish, you're dead. You know, there's nothing you could do there. No, I didn't get any time off. Don't forget that uh, when the campaign was over, and this is this is what annoys me, that people uh, under 80 don't know what really went on. When the campaign was over in North Africa, we went back to Algeria, and uh, we were stationed just outside Algiers itself. And uh, they were going, they were, the plan had been made to invade Sicily. But they needed more men to, to replace those who'd been wounded in the North African campaign. So what they did, they took a load of men from each battalion. And so all the battalions were, were only three or four hundred men at the most in them. And the same happened with mine. And uh, in Algiers itself was the headquarters of uh, all the, uh, the army commanders and the RAF and the Navy. Eisenhower, Montgomery... Oh, they were all there, and they were actually, they'd laid the plans out for the invasion of Sicily, obviously, but then they, they were laying out the plans for the invasion of Italy. And um, they had to get to Sicily, because if you're going to land in Italy, you've got to be able to have aircraft cover. So if you get, you've got to get an airfield in Sicily. Well, therefore, the, the, the aircraft, the fighter, fighter plane, can only go a certain mileage, so you're going to have to find a spot where you can land within the, the range of the, the protective aircraft. And that's what they were doing. And then that, that, that brings me to one of my famous stories, but it'll be here all night. <laughs> no, come on. Uh, oh, 
well, it, it covers a period of about 20 odd years. But this is how to, well, at that time, there's a, a brewery in Scotland called Tenants, very famous brewery on the banks of the Clyde. And one of their directors, I don't know any names on this, was uh, at a relative for uh, a friend in the Black Watch. And he arranged by some means or other that one of the ships going out to Algiers would take bottles of, of their famous uh, beer. And these were uh, litre bottles with a toggle cap, you know, they twist, like the one I've got there. And it, one, one uh, load had gone over and been very welcomely received by the, the lads. And the word came, there's another one on its way, but it, when, when, when uh, the ship arrived, half it was missing. So an officer and a couple of lads went down to try find out what the docks in Algiers, because the Arabs are the world's worst thieves when it comes to it, and they're very good at it too. Anyway, they couldn't get any information, so they went to see the town major, who was in charge of all the security of the, of the area. And uh, they asked him, uh, could he do anything, and had he heard about it? And he said, no, he said, we, we can't do anything about it. And that was the end of the matter. But then, and this is where I come into <laughs> 20 years afterwards, I'm in Roxdale Birch Hill Hospital. I just had a major ma uh, operation on my stomach. And the firm I'd, I was working for had me in Booper. So I was in a private ward, with two beds in it. And they brought this chap in, and uh, we got talking. I just had my operation, recovering. And of course, as it was, it, the, the talk turned to the war. Oh, yes, said this chap. He said, I was in Algiers. He said, I was a town major there. Oh, I said, did you ever find out who pinched all our beer? Oh, yes, he said, yeah, just saved many lives. I wouldn't even chuck myself. So what do you mean? He said, so who was it that took it? He said, it was me. <laughs> so I said, how did it with you? He said, well, what happened was, and this is the story, take it or leave it, <laughs> the headquarters in Algiers of the military, of the armed forces, an Arab had been caught, it was a cleaner, and he'd been caught going into the room where uh, all the decisions were made, emptying the waste paper baskets, but instead of taking the waste paper to be destroyed, he, he got it into a bag and taken it out. And they, they believed he was taking all the information to a, a, a German spy in Algiers. So they arrested him. But nobody could make him talk. And this is where the, the town major gets on the story. He said, so I'm sat in my office there. I just got a rollicking for not being able to get any information out of the Arab. He said, in walked a, a, an officer from the French Foreign Legion. The headquarters on the Rue Michelet in Algiers, the main road in Algiers. And he uh, said, uh, you're looking glum, what's the matter? Well, he said, I've got problems, I can't make this out of talk. So the F French Foreign Legion <laughs> officer said, well, give me a crate of your famous beer and we'll make it. Fair enough. So he said, uh, I purloined uh, a crate of your, well, that was 12 bottles of the beer. 12 litre bottles, can you imagine it? He said, and uh, what happened then, he said, it was disgusting. So I said, what? He said, well, he said, uh, they got the Arab, they, they, they stripped him to his loincloth, they tied him by his ankle so his head dangling a few inches from the floor, and then marched three French foreign legionnaires and urinated into his nostrils. And in three seconds he was telling them all they wanted to know. And that's why, I, 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 why the, the Brits don't use that method without leaving a mark. It was torture, but without leaving a mark. Do you believe that? Yes, yeah. every word of it. Wow. <laughs> so what happened then when you, when you went across to Italy? Oh, Italy, well, with something happened before that, oh yes, something happened before that. We got the word to say that we, uh, I was in the 4th British Division, 12th Brigade, 
and uh, we're told we're going on a special mission, one of Churchill's ideas. And this was to raid the Dodecane Islands to get a foothold there, the Greek islands. So we went to a place near um, Suez, Attica, the name of the place, uh, for training. And what it was, they built 60 foot derricks in the desert to assimilate the same conditions of a, on a transport ship. And we had to climb up and down faster and faster as though we're getting off the ship into boats and away, you see. And uh, we'd gone through quite a bit. And uh, he got called off. And the uh, what to do then? So we got leave, and this is in December 1943. And uh, we got 40 hours leave, and I go into Cairo with a friend of mine, a very good friend, had quite a lot of adventure together, and uh, his name was Vincent Fanchetti. Uh, we spent our money the first night. The second day, we, we went looking around. We had no money to spend hardly, and uh, we go to uh, 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 the uh, Egyptian, Egyptian Egyptology College where uh, there was a, a lecture in English, and uh, there's about 30, 40 people. You know when you have the the uh, the room where you slope down. The, I don't know what they call it, uh, the seats around they got, and then the lectures at the front. It was like that. And uh, it turns out the pyramids were really built. It's one of my uh, aggravations that the BBC always get this wrong anyway. They always show you films of people heaving four foot cubes of, of stone up, up, up. Well, that's absolute codswell up, you know. What they do, this fellow said, really, this lecture said, the pyramids were moulded, he said, uh, and they give me the reasons. There's no way could they uh, hew out accurately four foot cubes and kind of get them all the way. All they did was crush the stone. They have got limestone and the sand together, mix it, and carry them up in the sheep's bladder shoe, bagged over the shoulders, mix it in sight, uh, uh, and uh, that's as simple as that. And he said, how do we know? He said, well, he said, um, we we di di dissected some of these four foot cubes he said and we found human hairs inside them so obviously they... and then many years later I, I wrote th about this into one of the national papers Daily Mail it was and there was two um, builders who wrote back to him yes he said we've been up there he said and it, it's absolutely right the, the story about them being moulded because there's no uh, sign of age, like they, you get a line to a, the Sphinx like that, because they're hewn out of uh, solid rock. But uh, there's no strata marks on, on the, any of the pyramid blocks. So the pyramids, contrary to common belief, were moulded rather than hewn out and carried down on it. So you've learnt something. Very interesting. Well, yeah, I'm not finished <laughs> yet. Yeah. So anyway, we... In February, we set sail for um, Italy. And we went on to... Italy, of course, you, you'll know this. That on the on the west coast, the Tyrian seaside, uh, the Arunzi Mountains, and then if you go towards the... Um, what do you call it? It's the um, Adriatic. Uh, they've got the Abruzzes. In between is the Lady Valley. Uh, and this is traditionally the way that all invading forces would move up to Rome. Gaeta was one of the, uh, where, where we're talking about, we landed, was, we landed in Naples, but uh, Gaeta um, was one of the historic ports there. The Spaniards and the French had landed there and invaded uh, Italy and, and had forced way up to, up to, to Rome. But uh, we landed and, we, and it was, uh, the worst winter the Italians have ever had and uh, our first uh, objective was uh, Mount Ornito which was on the, uh, the Runcy Mountains and we were part of the American 5th Army. The American 5th Army had about five British divisions in it as well as their own people and uh, when we got up there 
we had to go up with toggle ropes, you, like mountaineers. The uh, snow started to come, and uh, we just had to wade through it. It was just a holding position. We were there for about uh, three weeks, and during that time, you could see right down southward, down the coast, and uh, way down south, the whole sky went red, and that was Naples. And we thought that um, Naples had been bombed by the Germans, but it wasn't. If Vesuvius was erupting, March 16th it was, 1944. And uh, two days later, the snow was completely covered with ash. It was unbelievable. Uh, there were one or two exciting things happened there. We had one or two, I would say, four days with the Germans. But uh, the, the most amazing thing, and one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, really, was we were about 13 or 14 miles from the sea. But a British warship, the War Spy, opened up its searchlights. And the Germans were on the side where the searchlight hit, and we could see them. It was unbelievable. This just scattered. Uh, of course, with the weather being it was in, in, in the mountains, you can't chase after people. But, uh, yes, and then uh, another amazing thing happened. As we were just about to be relieved, we heard the tinkling of bells. And up the mountain came loads and loads of sheep. And then these sheep were followed by women. Uh, <laughs> and it was the goons, the, the French uh, the French army. The, old, the women used to go in front of them, not daft. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and... Uh, they had lo the, even the blokes had long frocks on, yeah. But the women were horrible to look at, really. They really were. Mind you. Yeah. And then, uh, and then oh, I, yes, I became famous there because uh, we used to get our rations from uh, Palestine. And we used to get the hard tap biscuits, the like rocks. But they're all, um, all infested with weevils. You could see them, you know in the biscuits and uh, one day I'm looking at it I thought well we'll have to you know that was to eat kind of thing that time we also used to see what they call high altitude rations that was chocolate a special chocolate by rounties it's a kind of a, a black chocolate it's supposed to give you energy you know <laughs> energy <laughs> laughable that uh, so what I did I melted uh, the, the chocolate and dipped the uh, they had tap biscuits in them, and they were they were really gorgeous. And and the weevils were like currants, you know. So uh, there you are. You don't believe it's true. It's absolutely true. <coughs> <laughs> so what else did you have uh, food-wise while you were abroad? It was horrible. Bully beef mostly. Occasionally we got the um, the American rations because we were in the American. Fifth Army, and they were out of this world, you know, all, all kind of things. I don't even know the names of them, but they were. They were uh, the American fed their troops very well. Then we came out of there, uh, March, and uh, immediately went down to uh, Casino. This the, uh, we'd actually Casino Monastery had been bombed. Uh, I'll show you pictures that after. The the casino monastery had been bombed and then the town had been bombed and it was flattened. And uh, we went to a place just east of there. Um, I'm trying to think of the name now. Sant Santa Lia. It was, uh, I've been back since uh, a couple of times. Uh, kind of a holding position. It didn't, much didn't happen there. And then we got moved into Casino Town, and that was terrible. Uh, our our uh, opponents were the German paratroops, and the, uh, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting there. But of course, you couldn't dig in there because the uh, there's no soil. Well, all the ruins were was rock on the mountain side. That was that was the mountain leading up to the monastery above. Um, and of course, you, you, what you did, you, you, you got the rocks together and you built like kind of a protection round where you were. And you'd have to stay there 24 hours to relieve yourself 
And we used to have a string, we used to pull the rations in from somewhere where they couldn't be seen. And uh, sometimes the Germans would throw grenades at us and uh, we'd fire back, but uh, it was very unpleasant there. And then uh, we had a couple of trips down there. Yes. And then, uh, do you want another story? Yes. Right. <coughs> We, what happened was, you, you'll appreciate, you could go a month without having a wash. There's no water, you see. You couldn't get it anyway, unless there was a river and you could do that. The Indian troops used to go, get start naked nearly in, in, in the river, but we didn't fancy that. Anyway, this particular time, it's April. And we came out of the line to a place called Aquafundata which means the water of the fountain in Italian. And there's hot springs there, evil smelling springs. And uh, the Royal Engineers had rigged up showers. They were pumping the water in and then the, the waste water would go into the river. And we just had ours and uh, the, the Germans could see us probably from the mountains, from the, the Abruzzi mountains. And every now and then a shell had come down nearby, you know. And uh, they, they were shelling us for this particular morning. I got dressed with my friend Vincent. Because when you've had a shower and you've changed your cl underclothes, sometimes I say that one for three weeks or more, you'd do what we, we were good at it, Vincent and I, we were well known, scrounging. We'd go out afterwards and look to see if there's any farms or any houses where sometimes the people, the civilians had dashed down out of the way and there'd be chickens there and there'd be little piglets and we could all bring them back to our cook, you know, butcher. Anyway, we were just getting ready to go out when the shelling started and then one went near, near to us. Now out of the, all the debris that came down came this vehicle. It was, uh, you know, the old ice cream cart with the side loaded thing where you buy your ice cream. One like that. And it was the Salvation Army. And uh, these are very famous people. Captain and Mrs. Roberts. They never get a mention, but I mention them. Um, <laughs> you know the word hempecked? Well, he was hempecked, that poor fellow. Captain Roberts. But Miss, Mrs. Roberts was a bully woman, plenty of her, you know. And she used to cook what was famous in, in the 8th Army was rock buns. They said that if, if you threw one at a German and hit him, it'd kill him. It was that hard. But uh, they lined up with all the lads there, and lads were start naked, you know, getting the chain of the clothes. Come on, lads, cup of tea. And they, they, Captain Roberts would give him the tea, and Mrs. Roberts would give him a bun, and, and she'd give him a kiss if she could. She was a lovely woman, and she followed the division all the way up to Italy. Uh, they never got a mention, so it's unfair. But then, so, Vincent and I get off out of the way. We got to go in scrounging. We're walking along through some woods and all at once we had a boom, boom, boom. And, uh, this is how this, this is where the story about this comes into it. It's in there, what we saw. Uh, going to this clearing and there's this Polish battery three uh, 25 pounders and we sat there watching all of a sudden out of the wood came this bear look out we shouted you know nobody took any notice the bear's walking upright and uh, comes down puts a shell on the trail uh, arms of the, the gun that's the end of the gun and it ambles off on it, forward, back into the wood, comes out again, another shell, puts it down. So we thought, well, it must be a circus bear, you see. But of course it wasn't, it was Vo Wojtek. And uh, it's famous. And that's, I saw, as I saw the bear, and uh, for years, I've, when I got home and uh, I've, I've, I married, my wife was a wren, and I got married, 48. He was to tell her this story, she said, that's a right load of bull. <laughs> and she say, eventually you say to her, when we're anywhere, 
tell them the story about the bear and, and uh, kind of ridicule me, you see. Well, any this particular day we go to a Polish social in Manchester and uh, we were talking to Jez, the president of the, of the Polish veterans. And she said, oh, I, she, I said, tell us a story about the bear. Oh, yes, said Jez. That would be Wojtek. You pronounce it Wojtek. You spell it that way. But it's well, my wife's face, I never let it live down after that. <laughs> she would never believe me. And the story's in the book, anyway. So, um, we, after that, well, after we left, uh, this is only one day, we, we left uh, the the bear and uh, we, we went further downwards and all at once out on the other side of the wood came this very large American Negro soldier. Halt, he says. He had no gun like. And, uh, what, he said, what's you doing? What's you doing here? So Vincent, who was a bit cleverer than me, we're looking for food, he said. So there's Americans, what do you mean, looking for food? He said, we've just come out of the line of the casino. Wait a minute, he said, I'll go and see the lieutenant. So he, he goes into the wood and comes out with this office, nearly as big as him anyway. And another Negro, and then he said, Sam or whatever his name was, tells me that you're, uh, you're looking for food. He said, yes, come with me, he said. Well, we went to this wood, I never seen like it in my life. It's like fairyland. The pathways had little lights on them. That obviously to guide people through. And uh, up above in the trees was like camouflage netting and other little twinkling lights. So you could just see a glow. You could just see your way through the woods. And we came to this clearing. It was a great big uh, hut. We used to call them nest nuts, but it wasn't a nest nut. It was bigger than not much bigger. We go inside and there's about 20 tables there. And a load of Negro soldiers sat round, 20 or 30 of them. And at the top end was this uh, cooker, well, serving bit where all the food was. And the officer goes up and says to the chap, cook it. He said, give these men a number one breakfast. <laughs> mm. I've never seen it like it in my life. The plate was like that. And uh, three eggs, three sausage. I can go on and on. Brown hash, which I never had before, tomatoes, but you name it, it was there. Well, we finished that off, and the, the, the men were coming over trying to talk to what was it like in there, what's it like in there. Then one of them gets up and goes into the corner near where the serving hatch was, and there's a machine there. You know the machine where you ball and it goes in and out like that. Well, it's like that without the thing on it. It was just flat, and then there was a kind of a, a lid. He puts a coin in and there's a brrrr, and about a minute or two afterwards, out comes hot steaming donuts. Unbelievable! So they bring them over to us and said, would you like these? So, oh, yes. Well, they all wanted to do it then. We, we finished up having about 20 brown bags of, of donuts for our friend. And it's time to go, and they escorted us out. And as we're going out, we could see people holes in the... Uh, uh, long tank, uh, right, long tanks, there, like submarines they were, and then men came out with like spacemen, and uh, we suddenly realised what it was because just at the side there was a sign. It said, "Number three, uh, American chemical unit." It was poison gas. In case the Germans used it, they, they'd actually had uh, a disaster in Barry Harbour, where uh, the Germans had bombed a ship which the Americans had poison gas on, and it killed 2,000 um, Italians in the area. So this is one of the, the they carry there just in case they used it. So uh, that was my birthday, incidentally, the 19th of April, uh, 1944. All, all in one day. Not so, finished yet. Well, from there, um, you've got a photograph up there, um, that was the final. That's the final battle. That was the British battle, the biggest battle of the war, basically, the crossing the Rapido River. Well, I could go on for hours on that one. Just to say that we, we crossed it. We lost. We had sixty percent casualties, and then the Germans. We actually got to our objective, 
and the Germans had to evacuate the monastery and then the Poles came in from the other side and it was on the way to Rome then. We actually got to Rome three days before the Normandy landing. And this is one of the things that always irritates people who fought in Italy and uh, in the 8th Army, is the BBC in particular, um, they, they, they refer to like the Normandy landing as the, the liberation of Europe. Well, we'd landed in Italy nine months before that. I mean, it's unbelievable. And we actually got to Rome, and Rome was liberated two days before they landed in Normandy. So you can't say that uh, it was a liberation of Europe. Anyway, we got from Rome. We went on, fought the way up Lake Trasimena until we came to the big one in Tuscany, uh, in the Chianti Mountains. It was Monte Scalari. That was some buckle, that was the Maybe Italian only. There was a lot of hand to hand there, and uh, eventually, in August, first week in August, we uh, we got relieved because uh, Rome, uh, Rome had, uh, uh, sorry, Florence had uh, been liberated. They declared it an open city, and uh, good job they did because I've been back many times. It's a beautiful place, Florence. And then from there we had a re bit of a rest and uh, in between times is my adventure with the, I was told you about the Hollywood film star. And then after that in September 1944, we went to the Adriatic coast, place a place called Coriana Ridge. That's another big battle. And we moved up there to the Savio River <coughs> Uh, and Cesena, and from Cesena to the airfield, a place called Forley. But the weather was so bad, it never stopped raining for a month. Everything was flooded, you couldn't move. I mean, the trucks had to be pushed, it wouldn't be driven, you had to push a truck. Um, and then uh, December, in the December we uh, were told that we we're going on the leave. Any, any unit that fights for eight to nine months solid, gets a, a, you go to Palestine for a rest. You know, but in other words, we take over the policing of Palestine, but there were no fighting. And uh, we were down, going down towards uh, Toronto to get on the boats to go, when suddenly you got uh, instructions that we had to go to Greece. The Greek Civil War had started. And what happened there was, uh, this is, this could be very nasty, the, uh, there was a royalist, that was a, a, a faction like you've got in Egypt now, you've got the royalist uh, and then there was the communist, which was the Elaths, and uh, both had fought uh, as partisans in the war, but uh, the royalists had done more, they'd been uh, fed with ammunition and weapons by the Russians and of course as Churchill said afterwards um, if the Rus if the, the uh, communist Elas had captured Athens that would mean that the Russians could have set up a base, a naval base in the Mediterranean and that could have been deadly so that's why we were sent there to stop and the five British divisions went there and it's Afghanistan now, you know, they talk about uh, the 350 odd in, in, in 11 years they've lost. You'd lose that in a day in, in, in Greece. Um, so we had to, we had to, we landed at uh, Piraeus, which is about seven miles from Athens itself. And had to fight our way up. We had the Gurkhas with us as well. Um, and it was then, this is a good one, uh, <laughs> Christmas Day. 1944. Being the jocks, we don't celebrate Christmas. Well, we're in a, a kind of industrial area, a big factory, and uh, we, the Elas, you never knew was who there because in the in the daytime there were civilians, at night time they'd come and attack you. Uh, the, the, you know, it, it was on, there was no uniform, you couldn't identify anybody. Even children of eight were rolling grenades down there like you. 
So it was very, very tricky there. You, I mean, what could you do? You couldn't kill a kid of eight. But they were still rolling grenades down. Oh, women with uh, grenades down the, the, what do you call it? The brad. Uh, anyway, this, this Christmas, the Elas decided to attack this uh, thinking that they'd be celebrating Christmas. Well, the jocks with that was my bit telling. And uh, we drove them off, but we got some casualties. So I had to take with the guards, the wounded lads, down to the hospital, the field hospital, that was a 12th field, uh, just near Athens, well, just the south of Athens. And while we were there, I got instructions to go uh, as a guard. The VIPs who were in Athens itself. When we get there, it was Churchill. There was Churchill, Anthony Eden, uh, there's some Labour MPs, the Archbishop of Greece. Matt Millen was there, but he was an officer serving with General, Sco uh, General Scobie. He was a general in charge. And uh, there's some civilians, and I'm walking a few yards behind Churchill with a Greek lady named Irula, and a Greek sniper took a shot at Churchill, missed him and killed her it ran in the throat. And... Uh, Churchill was uh, very upset about that, I can assure you. He, it was a, quite a, a nasty, because she was a nice lady, she was about 40 years of age. She was quite nice. And uh, from then off, of course, we, the campaign in, in uh, well, the campaign in Greece stopped. And uh, we the battalion, except my company, D Company, the rest of the battalion went to Corfu over the time of the lives, the island of Corfu. And we went to a place called Arta, which is uh, a town on the west coast. Now there's a story here that may shock you, but if you want to hear it, it's uh, how our padre went into the brothel by mistakes. <laughs> want to hear it? Right. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, we go to Arta, and the main reason why I went to Arta was the UNRWA just started, United Nations Relief Agency. And uh, the Americans are, are organising most of this. And the idea was very good. They would go up into the hills and don't forget the, uh, the mountain. The mountains of Greece a lot higher than anywhere else in, in, the, in the Mediterranean. Four or five thousand foot high. But they also have villages there. And these villages are really, they call them the Andarkis. That means the brigands. Sometimes they raid the main highways uh, uh, and rob people. There's a way of life, like the mountain men in, in, in America. The same thing. And uh, But we had to go along there, so they had to have an escort, the under people, and we were the escort. Well, the paddy, <laughs> the paddy, we, don't forget the jocks of Presbyterian, Scottish Presbyterian, you see, was in Corfu. It was about 60 miles from where we were in Arta. So it meant you had to get up early uh, on a Saturday to get the boat all, well, it's only a short distance to the mainland, and then a motor down. So the next day he would give a service to the lad in the, the company. He'd come once a month kind of thing. But also he would bring information uh, about the battalion, what was happening, what wasn't happening from the RHQ. And uh, so this particular Saturday morning, unless all we're going up to, up toward the mountains, we had jeeps. I was at the in the back jeeps with the sergeant major and the uh, and the company commander was there, and uh, we were waiting for the paddy to come because before he could go off, it, the company commander had to know what was going on, what, what the instructions were for the following week, and. Uh, Arta is a beautiful little place. It's famous for its humpback bridge. 7,000 years old it's supposed to be. It goes up like that. You couldn't drive a car over it because it'd rock. But it was 7,000 years old. And uh, the, 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 all the houses, or nearly all the houses, are a single story. And they were painted in a kind of a a, a colour, a, a bright colour. There'd be pinks and the yellows and greens, you know, that and whites. And they looked really nice, they all had flowers hanging out. Anyway, 
And don't forget, when they talk about brothels in Greece, that they're legalised there, without a bounce of the British Army, obviously. But they, uh, they part and like, they even have some for under 18 years of age there. But they, they should, and it was a big, long building. The paddy comes charging down to his first visit and stops right outside the brothel. Goes in, and we're, we're waiting, looking for him, uh, and we could see him. He goes in, and two minutes later, he comes out, and there's, the madame's shaking her fist. <laughs> 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 and, uh, the, I've never known the pad, they'd be angry, he was a smashing bloke. Uh, anyway, he goes down, he goes, leaves there, and goes into the main square where our CO is. And, uh, our officer commanded to say, and uh, he give, he, the first thing he said was, I want a tin of paint and a brush. And he gave the uh, the instructions to uh, the CO, and we're on our way off. We're off, you see. He'd read them, and that was it. Up the mountain. About 30 or 40 vehicles going up, all with, uh, some with, well, a lot with food and, and seeds mostly. Uh, and equipment to sow the seeds for all these people who were starving, they really were starving the Greeks. And <laughs> they're saying, you know, we turn around at the top looking down into where the artery was, and there's a pansy, and he's drawing the outer bound circle on, on the brothel wall, out of the old big black circle and the cross. That was it, you see. Well, we're away a week. Uh, and it, I can't go into detail there because they're not very interesting, but. We went to the, the no match with the the mares, and they're all after the equipment. Obviously, when they gave the stuff out, uh, we managed to protect the underpeel civilians. We're coming down, we get to the top, get looking down, and every house in Arthur has <laughs> the sign on it. <laughs> and the CO said, Good God, the paddy's gone berserk. Uh, anyway, we get down, and for some own reason, the Americans were in front, Miss Scott on it, Miss Scott, that was it, Miss Scott. Uh, she's in front, and all the civilians out there cheering her, clapping on like this. We were completely ignored, you see. So, uh, 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 the Colonel says, the, the Major said to his second in command, who had met him, what's going on? He said, what's, on? He said, what's all this about the, about the pandy? The pandy done, oh, he said, no, he said, no. So what is it? He said, well, in, in an infantry town, they have what they call the pioneers. They're the maintenance men, each company. They do all that the work, like diffusing bombs and all that kind of stuff, you see, engineering, mechanics, and anything, any of the dirty work. And what has happened was, one of these lads had, had met somebody in, in, in Arta, who'd asked him what it meant, the, the big black circle and the cross. And this fellow said, well, if you've got one of them on your house, you'll get double rations from UNRWA. <laughs> so everybody had paid. <laughs> right? Right, well, so then, uh, a week after, oh, there's, there's one I missed, and there's one, yeah, there's another good one about the sergeant major. Our sergeant major was a little fellow, he's only about five foot six. Tommy. Came from Liverpool. And uh, when we were in, in Athens itself, we had a cook who came from the Army Catering Corps. That's the ACC. He, he wasn't one of the lads, he was supposed to be, and he was a good cook. But for some odd reason, Tommy didn't like him because he reckoned he wasn't clean enough. He told me he was absolutely spot on about cleanliness, was next to godliness. And he was right, of course. And any chance he had, uh, Tommy would have a go at the cook. Because, because he wasn't a member of the town, he couldn't do very much about it. But it, it was to annoy him. So, and with him, <laughs> this particular day, he said, uh, come with me, he said, I'm going inspecting that so-and-so cookhouse. He said, I'll bet He's not clean then. So he goes in there, and Tommy's going round doing this. And, <laughs> and then she's two lads there, 
Well, you've never seen two scruffy lads in your life. But you have to remember the Greeks were really in a bad way. I mean, they, they had a rough time with the Germans. What are you doing here? He said. They couldn't understand the words. He said to the co what's the other doing it? Oh, he said, uh, he said, I need some assistance. He said, and uh, he said, I need some food. He said, so I'm giving a couple of tins of bully for the coming cleaning up. Not good enough. Get them out of here, said Tommy. So the lads go off like interpreters with us, by the way, and he told them, get said, the sergeant mission, you've got to go. A couple of minutes after, up come this woman, a very attractive young lady, well, she wasn't young, she was the mother of these two lads. She's plain hell there. And uh, she, she's saying to the interpreter, who was it turned away? She goes up to Tommy, and she's going to kill him. <laughs> so Tommy goes back, never seen Tommy frightened, and goes out of the way. So, <laughs> so uh, Tommy said, what's all that? I said, well, she said, you've upset her. Oh, he said, I'm not having scruffy Greeks working in, in, in my cookhouse. Well, the story ended there for a while, and a, about a week later, I get word, uh, Sergeant Major, and you've got to go to the uh, headquarters, there's a, a meeting on. We think we're going home. So I was looking for Tommy. Where's Tommy? So I thought, he must be at the cookhouse, you know. <laughs> so I go to the cookhouse, I said, have you seen Tommy? I said, he's with that woman. I said, what do you mean? He said, the woman down the road there. So he goes down the road. It's more of very small. It's about the house and duck was bigger than this room. And right in the middle, uh, at the back, there's a bit of a garden. And Tommy's there in a, a galvanised bath, stark naked, and she's washing him down. You see, it's his mother. <laughs> and Tommy's smoking away there while she... Don't forget it. So... Uh, I said, uh, Tommy, uh, there's a meeting on, he said, oh, all right, he said. He said, you know, lad, he said, uh, the, he said, it comes to those who wait. He said, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> that was it, Tommy, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, so, in June, uh, we got instructions to go back to the UK. So we we came back. And the funny thing was, we landed in Liverpool, and uh, as we're on the train going, we're going to a place called Market Raisin uh, in Lincolnshire uh, to Osgodsby Camp. It's just near Market Raisin, and the train actually passed the house where I used to be a lodger, and <laughs> and I said I used to live there, but uh, uh, we couldn't get off, of course. Anyway, we get to um, Osgodby camp and uh, because the war was over and because I was in a territorial battalion, the Six Black Watch, territorial battalions went into what they call suspended denomination. In other words, they closed down. So we got transferred to the sister regiment, which was the first Argyll and Southern Highlanders. And... Uh, they were going to Japan to fight the Japs and they were going in the 6th Airborne. Uh, some of us went down to uh, Salisbury Plain to do some training in and out of gliders, which was quite a thrill. And uh, we set off, the, just as they set off, they dropped the A-bomb. And of course the war was over. Well, there's no, it was panic stations, you see. Troopers going to various places they no need, were needed. So we got to, uh, dropped off in Haifa, in uh, Palestine. And at uh, that time, uh, trouble was brewing because a lot of the immigrants from the uh, camps and the uh, death camps been uh, relieved or, or saved by British troops were trying to make the way to Israel, lots of Jewish sections, people from Warsaw, out of the ghetto and uh, we landed, as I say, at Haifa and went to a, what they call Camp 21 um, which was a an old army camp uh, which had very old fashioned uh, toilets. They were like big.
concrete holes in the ground with like um, 10 or 12 sections in them. You know, all open like. But, uh, and uh, Camp 21 was, was quite amazing because we were the first there and we had to set up some of the tents for some of the lads that coming later on. And I always remember we had a lot of uh, lads who just joined the army with us. Of course, we were all soldiers uh, to take, take advantage of that. And this particular night, <laughs> they were on guard and uh, they had the Bren gunners on guard. And uh, about two o'clock in the morning, I was awake with a brr. The Brens were going like the clappers. And dashed out and there's this young, very green soldier. He'd only been in the army a couple of months. He was terrified he was with his bread. And uh, all around there were eyes. You could see eyes glowing in the dark. And what it was, it was the pions, the desert wolves. They were, they were ready to tap the camp. And they'd seen the eyes and thought it was somebody trying to break the thing. And he'd shot quite a few of them. But there's one that was badly wounded, but it was it was going going to have a go. We had to kill that one, and uh, that was quite an experience. And the officers, who I knew, one of them I knew very well. Uh, he'd been with me in the Black Watch, and uh, he said, "Let's forget this. Nobody knows anything about it." You see, right enough. But then, the next morning, about nine o'clock, a dispatch rider arrives up with a message uh, for the officer. And it went something like this. Uh, have you any knowledge of, or did you do any firing during the night? And what happened was, when he'd been firing, he'd gone down into the valley, and the brigadier of, of the 6th Airborne, there was on his belly. <laughs> the bullets were zooming through his belly. Uh, in, oh, yes, it was, we kept it very quiet, by the way. Nobody ever found out. But the first time it's ever been disclosed, I think. But uh, that was the first time in... in uh, in Palestine, and one thing I was, always strikes me. I've never forgotten. It was the Arabs in, in in on the Gaza Strip. There, they're still like that today, basically, and I can't understand why. Sixty, seventy years afterward, they these people haven't got a place of their own. I don't. It seems. Uh, anyway, from then we went on to Jerusalem. The first battalion of girls in Jerusalem. And uh, my, I was in H Q, Q Company because I was an old soldier. Um, I was corporal and sar sergeant, and uh, we were in this hospice, Notre Dame of France, which was um, a Catholic uh, kind of uh, place to stay while as pilgrims. The roof all concrete, no paper, just bare walls. With a bed in a wash basin. That was it, and uh, we we were situated between the Damascus Gate and the New Gate of the Walled City. Now then, from where the hospice was like this, there was the road, there was wasteland, and then there's the wall around the old city. And it's a wonderful thing when you've never been. And just at the back of it, for what we could see, was we called it the Blue Mosque. You see it now as golden, but in the morning, when the sun goes on, it goes blue. The mo that's the mosque where all the dispute is. And um, there's quite a lot of aggravation there. So we were basically told to uh, keep quiet. There was one place where the lads could go, the Queen's, Queen's pub it was, basically, in Jerusalem. And... Uh, they went there for a week, some of our lads, and then uh, one of the Jewish terrorists decided to uh, toss a grenade and killed a couple. So that was out of bounds. Uh, and then uh, we had to go and look for uh, arms and ammunition in some of the uh, the Jewish camps. And there was a Jewish camp called Givet Shawl. Uh, and at that time, we were liaisoning on with the... Uh, Palestine police. This was a, a civilian body uh, who, who literally took control because Palestine was a protector under the League of Nations before the United Nations came out and the, the Brits were responsible for the 
security of, of Palestine and keep it between the Jews and the Arabs. Uh, we really give it shawl. It was a kind of a camp for Jewish immigrants. And when we got there, there was nothing. The only thing we saw was a half-naked middle-aged woman who was chained to a um, a pole with a corrugated sheet roof over the top. And she was an imbecile. And I don't know whether that was the the method how they got rid of them without killing them there and then. But that she was left there, baited to die. Anyway, we didn't find anything. So we go back to the hospice and we go in the sergeant's mess. And I, I always remember this. I got the blame for it. I said, well, that's it then. Somebody told them we were coming. It must have been the Palestine police. I said, I bet if we go back, we'd find the arms. And a voice said, that's a bloody good idea. And it was a brigadier. And there we go, Whoa. So we went back, and sure enough, we found them putting the arms back. Uh, that was at Give It Shaw. That was one incident. Another incident was a big one, which has never been disclosed. It was called Operation Agatha. And this was the arresting of Rabbi Fishman, who was the head of the Jewish community at the Jewish Agency in Jerusalem. It was on a Friday. And I went with our uh, commanding officer uh, and uh, two lads as escort. And we get to the Jewish Agency and it's about seven o'clock at night. And the colonel goes up to the... Uh, the uh, rabbi, he was, he was aged, about 50, 60, or 70. And the rabbi said, uh, I have to tell you, you're under arrest and you have to go to Brigade HQ. And the rabbi said, I can't travel, oh no, I can't travel on the Sabbath. And the uh, Lumley Webb was our colonel's name, uh, MC, he was a good lad. Uh, he said, I'm sorry, but you'll have to come with us. So the rabbi spat in, in the, the colonel's face, you know, spat at him like that. And one of the lads got his rifle, uh, his hand there, like, and pushed him away. And next morning in America, we found this out afterwards, headlines in the, the Chicago Sun, British troops brutalised aged rabbi. Uh, and then we realised, of course, um, you know, what the the strength of the American voices was in Palestine. But then, when the rabbi had gone away in arrest, the SIB, that's the Special Investigation Bureau of the Army, went in, and we went in with them, and they ransacked the uh, agency, and they found letters which said, and this is from a, a group called the Hadassah Chapters, it's a women's group, very powerful, wealthy women's group in America, which said, please find in account so and so and so and so in the Swiss bank money to be used for the removal of British troops from Palestine. Uh, well, you can imagine how we used to feel about that one. Um, and they, they, they have a hospital there called the Hadasha Hospital which is the, was then, and probably still is, at then was the most modern hospital in the world. Famous Jewish doctors used to come from all over and give two years of their life in it. The hospital then was, and we're going back now, 1945, 46, 46, what, uh, 54, 64 years. It was like the modern hospitals are now in Britain. It was There was no ward as such. It was just like rooms with four beds in each. All the equipment was at this. Brilliant it was. Because what happened was a curfew was placed and we used to have to, strangely, I don't know why, we used to have to escort the nurses to the hospital. So we'd get them in taxis and we'd go as bodyguards, in other words, and uh, we'd stay there uh, and, and get them uh, back uh, next morning kind of thing, back to where they were, because of the curfew at night time. Um, and this, I always remember one time I go up, I know I've had about six lads with me and we were met by the secretary of the hospital which is very strange and uh, he got very friendly. he said would you uh, 
like a snack or something like that. I said, no, we're okay. And when he kept on, I thought there's something going on here. So I said to my cobble, I said, look out. I said, just walk down, down the, the path there and see what's going on. I said, but don't, if you see anything, don't say anything, let me know. So he comes back, he said, yes, he said, <laughs> there's a pair of boots in one of the beds. So there's somebody hiding there, you see. Anyway, we, we got them. We, we re there was two blokes. There were minor terrorists, of course, that got them. But then, as, as, just as we were taking them, going away, we saw what we thought was a boy running down the, uh, the, the, the end of the corridor. And it turns out he was another terrorist, but he was eventually the Prime Minister of uh, Palestine. If we'd have shot him, like we'd have changed the, uh, we could have shot him easily. Um, but uh, these things went on there, didn't they? and uh, the uh, the Arabs also had some peculiar things. Uh, we don't mention that, but the Arabs. I always remember a cartoon by a famous cartoonist. It shows you the Jewish engineers landscaping, you know, surveying the land and fat and buildings coming up. And it showed you the Arab sat cross legged done for 10,000 years. And that's how it was there. They didn't want to become modernised, the Arabs. And yet, outside the, the gates, the Damascus Gate, we could never go in unless there was four of us at least. And then underneath there was the uh, Jerusalem of Christ time. It was like subterranean markets and a beautiful place. But it, it, uh, at the entrance to the... Uh, the Damascus Gate was an Arab who had no eyes and only one hand and he had a leg off and he'd had these taken off deliberately so he could beg. It was, I don't, I could never understand the logic in this because it seems that under the the faith, the Mohammedan faith, we called them Mohammedans then, a, a rich man supposed to give so much of his income to the poor. And this bloke, literally, the Palestine police told us he had four wives and thousands of sheep, you know, and yet he used to go begging every day, sit there all day long, and people used to toss the coins into it. But uh, Palace, the, the, Jerusalem, the mark, the old city, you can feel the aura of the place. It's uh, the only thing that distressed me was in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was Arabs selling dirty postcards, but that. But that, that's the way they are, you see, they, they don't understand it. But uh, Jerusalem was something special. And what, one particular day, I, I'm, I'm what, look, checking the guard, uh, uh, where the, the main door was, we used to have a table with the guard on, and then the guard would go around the building and on the roof and what have you. One of the guard came in and said, uh, problem, he said, a big crowd marching towards us. So I looked out the door and there it was. Hundreds and hundreds of Arabs and they were carrying a, a mufti. You know, he's the bloke back there, chief priest. Is it? He had a green band round his head and he's on a stretcher, they're carrying him. And they put him down just on the grace ground, right in front of where our main entrance. So I immediately got all the orderly officers and his problems. So he gets on to be gained to, well, Red alert, he said, get the brain guns on the roof and all over the places, but don't do anything so unless you're attacked, you see, that was it. So we're on alert all night long. Well, we watched them and it got dark and they lit, lit a fire. Oh, they dug a trench first of all. Uh, when we checked it afterwards, it was six foot long and it must have been over six foot deep about three foot wide. And this mufti there, all chanting, they lifted the mufti in a kind of a rope thing and lowered him into this trench. And they all sat around, all uh, started to pray and what have you. And all night long there, I, I'm still awake, I'm, I'm nodding all the time. Comes eight o'clock in the morning and the, the, uh, the sun starts to come up and you can see the blue mosque and uh, then there's a kind of a rrr. you could tell that all the Arabs start to get up, tend their prayers, and uh, 
Oh, the old ones, they, they scattered like that. And out of this trench, this old man, he must have been about 60, came springing up. You're not going to, you don't believe it, I know, but I saw it, so I, I believe it. And we went down after to have a look in the trench. He believed himself there during the night. There's nothing there, not a thing there. Not a thing there. Now, I don't know how he got out. I don't know whether it might know matter what, but he actually came flying out of the trench. And uh, they cut all cheered and carried him away. That was it. So what was that for? Did was it? Uh... I don't know. I don't know whether to show off to us. Or we don't know what it was for. But uh, I have no idea what it was for. But uh, it, I would always remember it as long as I live. It's unbelievable. It was. Yes, a lot of things happened. But then, of course. Uh, Things took a turn for the worst. Uh, there's a picture. I've got one. A short picture of me. Three weeks after we raided the, the Jewish agency, I'm uh, there's a big hotel there called the, the King David in Jerusalem. It's their best hotel, really. And uh, we weren't allowed to go anywhere unless there was four of you. And one of the officers, we, we, as I say, the same bloke was a black watch officer. Um, he said, can you come with me, he said, and, uh, and somebody else said, for an escort, he said, I've got to go to the King David, because the GHQ of the British Army was there, on, on the left wing. He said, I've got business there, he said, oh, fair enough. So, we drove into the King David Hotel, and uh, the entrance is near the middle, and as I'm, I'm at the other end, there, at the other end of the hotel, and uh, this woman comes up to me and she said, I'm Mary Campbell of the News Chronicle. She said, uh, could you tell me uh, about yourself and what you're doing? I said, well, I'm just, just a soldier, you see. And just as she said that, there was a bang, bang, like rifle fire. Of course, that was it. She, she looked round and I goes to get my, uh, my gun out of the, the jeep. And there's a terrific explosion, and they blew the end off the. Uh, I've got a true photograph after. They blew the end off the uh, the King David Hotel. There's ninety odd got killed. There's bodies scattered all over the roadway. And what had happened was the Jewish terrorists had gone in with milk churned full of explosive, and detonated them. Uh, that was the King David Hotel. Well then. Um, let me see. That was just. But a couple of months afterwards, I, I'm uh, due, I'm due to mob basically. Uh, in a couple of weeks time, you know, a group number come up because I was young and single. I'd been in the army long, and a lot of married men with children, but, you know, I, I had to wait longer. And uh, I'm checking the guard. There was a curfew on after the explosion, the bombing of the hotel what have you um, and the, they had the bedrolls that we used to have the airborne bedrolls uh, and we got stuck outside the uh, batter shoe shop in Jerusalem and what had happened was the terrace had filled the shoes with explosives and the uh, detonator was wired to the clock so at seven o'clock it exploded and there must have been a hundred or so pairs of shoes there full of explosive and our lads underneath it and I'm just coming round to, to check and the whole lot went up. A uh, couple have got killed with a glass uh, and I got blown in the air, finished up in the hospital in, in uh, Cairo and went home on a hospital ship. So uh, and I went to uh, First of all, I went to Chester Military Hospital, and then I went to a place called Irving in uh, Ayrshire for rehabilitation. I was about six months overdue with the mob. But that was it, to the army life. So what happened to you when you were hit by the blast? What I went to hospital. I, I didn't know that. I was, a, a, I was flat out for a week or more. So how long were you in Palestine overall? From 
August, about 18 months. And were you aware of the troubles before you went there, the tension between the Arabs and the Jews? Well, not, not, we didn't, we, were, we knew, we didn't know what, what it was, what it was like, because uh, we knew that uh, the, um, there were immigrants landing all along the coast. The Greeks were making a fortune out of it. All these Greek shipholders and all these old ships, some were sinking with loads of people on them, halfway through there, from, going from Greece. Uh, they, they, they'd pay the money kind of thing and these would be Jewish people coming from all over the Europe you know all kinds of uh, nationalities wanting to go to the promised land as it were and uh, there was an agreement there was only about 1100 were allowed in every month well there was a thousand coming every day kind of thing and uh, the British troops I, I didn't get involved too much in that the uh, the British troops were um, having to arrest them, put them in, into cages, it were, you know, camps, and then send them to, to uh, Cyprus. They were going to uh, to Cyprus, like in, in camps in Cyprus. And then they, they were, as every month came along, somebody would come out and go in. That's the way they were doing it. In there. We, we had no choice. And then, of course, what happened was, the pressure got so great from the Americans, the Labour government had taken over and uh, Ernest Bevin was the, the Foreign Secretary and he literally caved into the American demand. This is why we're in a situation like it is now. He gave the... Uh, he kind of organised the meeting and chaired the meetings which agreed to give the uh, Jewish people what is now known as Israel but he didn't give anything for the Palestinians. They've no, they've no way to the sea, as it were, basically for industry, only on the Gaza Strip, and that's a waste of time. So there was completely split off along with the, uh, um, along the Jerusalem, uh, the West Bank as well. So uh, I reckon they got a raw deal. It, it, it was all American. The Americans have always pushed, even now with the, the problem in uh, Cairo. The Americans are, uh, you know, they're in a the right fix because the one man, uh, Mubarak, who, who'd give them support for keeping the uh, Arab terrorists away from Israel, he's the one man. If he goes and the brother would take over, there's going to be a bloodbath. Uh, the, well, man, on the other hand, of course, the Israelis have got the atom bomb and the uh, you know, I, I wouldn't put anything past them. I wouldn't. I hope they don't like, of course, but uh, no. No. So was your role sort of to police the... Did you have to do a lot of policing the streets during the uh, the curfews and things like that? No, we didn't police the streets. What we did, we did raids. You couldn't police the streets there because... If they knew you were going to police them and you had a regular thing, they knew what you were doing. Very clever. Don't forget, a lot of the Jewish terrorists were some of the Polish people who'd been in the ghettos in Warsaw uh, and fighting the Germans. They, they, you know, they, they knew all about uh, urban warfare. I mean, they, they captured the officers one time and stung them, hung them on the elliptus grove there. There were lots of things they did do that, that you know, that uh, I can't forget or, or forgive, really. Um, I, I was a captain of the football team, the Argyles, and we're playing the Arabs. There's a ground there, just opposite the King David Hotel, called the Arab School of Accountancy. And uh, as, we, as we, were, uh, we were playing them, the referee come, came into the dressing room and said, Ricky, go out now, I'll be starting. So I said to the Arab lad, you lead. He goes out, bang, 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 stepped on mines. They blamed us for that. I mean, we, we couldn't win the Brits, just couldn't win at all. Whatever we try to do, we always get the blame for. You know, it's, it's like Afghanistan and Iraq now. Well, Iraq, different matter, we, we are to blame in many ways for that. But, uh, no, uh, it... Uh, it's only memories to me now because I'm, I'm a survivor. There can't be many of us left, I don't think. 
So when you came back to England, uh, what did you do when you came out of hospital? Went rehabilitation in, in Irving. Uh, my legs was about battered a bit. And, uh, and then uh, I came home and uh, because uh, I'd brought my apprenticeship to join the army, a bit of trouble getting a job. But eventually I got uh, I, I made the renewal of apprenticeships came about uh, and I managed to get on that but I could only get a, a 11 12 of a journeyman in other words I, I had a reduced wage for it uh, and I had to learn all the, I forgot to tell you one story <coughs> I must tell you this one uh, before I was blown up, about a couple of weeks before, they, they started uh, an interrupted apprenticeship scheme in the British Army, and I had to go from Palestine to a place called Moaska near Cairo in Egypt, because there's an engineer's workshop there, and I had to go there to pick up, which is a good thing, pick up the threads of, don't forget, for five, six years, I'd not been on a lathe or anything like that. And I used to do a lot of very small work, very clever work. And uh, so I get there. <laughs> I'd travelled all day from Palestine to Moaska. And uh, I'm going to this Royal Engineers workshop. And there's four officers there, including the Colonel. He was Alan Clark. He's gone, what he said. We've got a job for you. Well, I've been travelling all day. Can you work at a watch lathe? They said, yes. I said, but I'm not one for six years, like. I said, I'll have to. Oh, he said, we've got a rush job. So I said, what is it? <laughs> he said, they brought out four, uh, well, they brought out four uh, shotguns, double barrel shotguns. We want firing pins. What did that was? These had been, how can I put, disarmed, as it were. They got hold of them. But they found out there were no firing pins in them. So they wanted me to turn some firing pins on the lathe. Why well, they could have, I don't know. So, fair enough. So I'll get, on a watch lathe, you've got to set the gears right. And you've got to have, I said, you've got to have the right material. You want an iron, uh, uh, iron, yeah. I said, I've got to heat treat them up, yeah. Right. Will they be ready in the morning? I thought, what the hell is this? So I'd been all day travelling, I worked from about, oh I had a meal, they gave me a meal, that's fair enough. And I worked from about 6 o'clock at night, right through to about 4 in the morning. And I did them the firing pins, I had to make sure they fit into the guns, that was it, fair enough. Sure enough, 8 o'clock in the morning, they roll up, I, I'm asleep. Take the guns, I'm told this afterwards, and that's it, and so... The ne next day I'm with the uh, uh, warrant officer to show me about the lathe. I'll get back on, get my fingers back again, you see. The officers come back. Ten minutes after, the whole place is surrounded by the Egyptian police, or the Egyptian army, it was. And what that was, is laughable. The reason why the shotguns, the geese were, were flying, uh, urbanating, you know, down to south flying geese and they're shooting the geese and they've gone in these jeep, two jeeps blasting away <laughs> the geese but what they didn't know was where the geese were flying was right over the, the royal palace and King Farouk and, 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 and Princess Farina were there in the swimming pool and all the lead shots <laughs> and they thought they were trying to they thought they were trying to do mischief to flee. so me making these firing pins uh, <laughs> cause I can't, it could have been a natural disaster. <laughs> you can't make things look like that, look. No. <laughs> so, after you came out of the army, did you keep in contact with any of your friends? Yeah, um, not immediately, because uh, uh, I found my, <laughs> found my first love, you see. Started courting. We got married in '48. '49 uh, December '49. My daughter and I, Susan, 
she's a she's a, a pensioner now, and uh, then the year after, man, yeah, I, I was start from scratch, no home, man. I'm, oh, well, here's a good one. Before I joined the army, one of my friends who worked in the town hall said, "Well, if you if you survive the war, I remember it would. If you survive the war, you don't want the house, yeah." He said, "Well, get registered now." So. I went to the town hall and, and, and got a green, I've still got it as a matter of fact, a green card. And it had on the top, MP6, non-priority 6. So the war's over and I get married. And I said, hey, I'm registered. So I go to the town hall and I said, uh, I want to, I want to uh, uh, a council house. Don't we all, said this bloke. I said, but I'm registered, how do you mean? So I produced the card. He said, name, he said, oh, he said, you can't accept this. He said, you're supposed to re-register every year. I said, how the bloody hell can I? I said, when I'm out in North Africa, Egypt, Palestine, the lot. Oh, that caused confusion. Anyway, I wrote a letter to the, to the uh, Manchester Evening News. I got my house in a, a week, and we were Northern Moor, it was 1950-something. And uh, and then we were building a house up, and then I got more time, and I uh, I found, I was a founder member of the Monte Cassino Veterans. I was, for 50 years, I was secretary. Um, and at uh, one time, I had over 4,000 members. But the membership was only open to those who were in combat or support. It wasn't open to the suppliers, you know. It was open to those, and uh, we uh, used to go back every year. Well, 1956 was the first year um, to the war grade. We kind of made the promise we'd never forget the lads. And uh, we kept the promise up. And, of course, in, in the process of doing that, we went to other battle fields in Italy. Uh, you know, Florence got made very welcome there, and even that place where the massacre was. I'll show you some pictures after. Um, and then uh, onto the Adriatic. This last year we were at, we at Chesternatico on the Adriatic coast, and uh, they think the world was there. We get very well looked after a bit, but of course, there's not many of us left now. We're down to about 20 or so from over 4,000. Had them all over the world, I remember. Americans, Canadian, and uh, what happened was about four or five years ago we closed down the Monte Casino Veterans Association and we handed it over to the sons and daughters and it's now called the Monte Casino Society, it's on the net. Uh, I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a newsletter and then you can get one somewhere. I think I am anyway. Yeah, you can see that with you if you're interested. The, uh, and they're, they're, they're up to about four or five hundred now, so they go back every year to maintain it because we made so many friends in uh, Italy. Uh, we, we, I, with two of the veterans, I say I give talks to the schools about mostly about the bear and uh, Manchester Blitz. I was in the Manchester Blitz, he don't know anything about that yet. Um, and we've, there's a place called Picanisco in the Abruzzi Mountain where the bab pipes are supposed to originate from 4,000 years ago. Not the bab pipes you know today, but... And uh, we have a contact there with the school. When we go, all the children come out and sing to us. They all dress up with Union Jacks on the caps uh, well, Union flags, I should say, and uh, they sing our national anthem, and then they start the second verse. None of us know it, you know, <laughs> and they're singing away in English. It's unbelievable. So we, we they, we've got local schools in Charlton who made contact with, with them through the internet, and they get, get together. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we we've been all over the place. Uh, we've been to. Uh, uh, I, I got a medal from the Polish government, the Gold Cross. Went to Warsaw to the president's place. The gang was went. Then we went to Krakow. 
We've been uh, there's actually British war graves in Krakow that no one ever goes to, in a terrible state they were. When they, when I came back to Britain, I informed the Commonwealth war graves, and uh, they put the matter right. But these are blokes who were captured at Dunkirk, uh, went into the salt mines near Krakow, died, and got buried there, and uh, the, all the, the uh, stones were broken. There was uh, moss and uh, wormholes and God knows what the shocking state. But uh, we met the bloke who trained that there. There, I was saying uh, we've been to quite a few places. The only place we don't go to is Germany. So you just mentioned what was the medal that you you received? The, the gold cross. The gold cross. Do you want to see him? Yes, yeah, love to. Can I go now? <laughs> just, uh, yeah, just unclip your mic.